Good morning. Our reading today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 5 to 15. I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplied the seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, hello, my name's Val. I'm one of the readers in this parish of St Mary's Withal. We are looking at the wonderful hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be Always Only, All For Thee, written by Francis Havergal. And today we've come to verse four, and we're thinking about the lines, Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. In 1878, four years after writing the hymn, Frances Havergal, who was the daughter and the sister of a Church of England minister and a lifelong supporter of the Church Missionary Society, she wrote to a friend, The Lord has shown me another little step, and of course I have taken it with extreme delight. Take my silver and my gold now means shipping off all my ornaments to the Church Missionary House, including a jewel cabinet that is really fit for a countess, where all will be accepted and disposed of for me. Nearly 50 articles are being packed up. I don't think I ever packed a box with such pleasure. With such pleasure. That's the key idea here, I think. Giving whatever God calls us to give and giving it with such pleasure. God loves a cheerful giver precisely because he is one, as it tells us in Proverbs 22, verse 9. It doesn't matter if you're living on a modest income or if you're one of those super rich individuals who signed the Giving Pledge in 2010 to give away at least half of their wealth, either in their lifetime or in their wills. The signatories included Warren Buffett, Bill Gates and his wife Melinda, and many other billionaires. By August 2010, the first 40 people had signed up with a total wealth of $125 billion. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I suppose, depending on your perspective, so far these people have only succeeded in accumulating more money than they've managed to give away. Although they have given away, probably more than all of us put together will make in an entire working lifetime. But giving half of a fortune worth several billions away still leaves an individual with, well, several billions. 
I don't think that's sacrificial giving, although I'm not at all denying that their pledge and their giving has brought and will bring about great good in the world. So well done them. But at the other end of the extreme, there's the widow who Jesus watched dropping two tiny coins, two mites, together worth only a few pennies, into the offering for the temple treasury. Jesus called all his disciples together and showed them how God values what we give by what it costs the person giving, not what the amount is. Look, Jesus said, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. And that's a challenge for us. That's why Paul begins with reminding the Corinthians of what they promised to give, so that by being reminded, they'd be ready and willing to give it, generously, not grudgingly. Like that widow, and I'm sure like those billionaires who pledge to give away their wealth, generously, not grudgingly. When David pledged to get the building of the temple started and he handed the project over to Solomon, his beloved son, he prayed to God and dedicated, dedicated to God all the gold and silver, all the jewels and other precious materials that would be used in the building. In 1 Corinthians 29 verse 14, David says, But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. In the old words that we often still use when we're dedicating the church offering to God, we say, all things come from you, and of your own do we give you. The quote from our hymn continues, you see, Not a might would I withhold. That's where the rubber hits the road, as they say. That's really tough. We're not called to give away our carefully calculated tithe, 10% before or after tax, the argument goes, whatever. We're called to give it all to God and treat all we own as his too. Then we perhaps won't take or keep back more than we need. The tithe in the Old Testament was always intended to be a starting point, but by the time of Jesus, as he famously mocked the Pharisees, it had become legalistic, a tenth of everything a Jew produced. In Luke 11 verse 42, Jesus cried out, Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, your rue and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practised the latter without leaving the former undone. So our hymn challenges us to give it all to God, to not withhold anything, anything, and that's really hard. In the 1980s, and still persisting today, I think, we saw the rise and increase in popularity of something called prosperity theology. Basically, that said, if you weren't financially successful, then you must have upset God in some way, because if you followed God truly, he would bless you financially. They took this idea from verses such as the one in this passage from Corinthians, twisting the words and the sense of them. Verse 10 says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way, so that you can be generous on every occasion. Prosperity theology is at heart an empty idea because it turns people from cheerful givers into materialistic, opportunistic investors, investors in God's kingdom, if you like, giving only an expectation of what God will give them in return. And that's actually the very opposite of what this passage asks of us. But it's so easy with all our possessions in our materialistic world to fall into that trap. But there is some truth that we will receive riches in return for our giving. Cheerful giving does bring us blessing because it's good for us to bless others. But the riches we receive in return for our financial giving are not 
financial riches. It's the knowledge that we're doing what God loves us to do. What the early church did, as we read in Acts chapter 2, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And the result? They praised God and enjoyed the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Maybe if we lived lives of more generosity, we might see more lives being saved. What we do get in return for our giving is the sense that we're doing what God wants us to do. So there's a closeness to God as a result. And others will praise God when they see how we live. They will be drawn to God and give their lives too to him. And haven't we seen that over this last year? Churches have been opening their doors and their resources to feed their communities and in so doing have drawn communities together, started conversations, fed souls as well as bodies. Let's hope and fervently pray that in our rush to get back to normal that we don't forget all of this. Much that's been forced on us by the pandemic actually needs to stay. But the key, the absolute key, is what we should be remembering when we give. The surpassing grace of God is freely given to us, granting us salvation even though we don't deserve it. So we should give generously, because the gift God has given us is indescribable, as Paul puts it. Indescribable, generous beyond measure, shaken, pressed down and running over. The measure I use when I give is what God will use to bless me. I give stuff, he gives blessings and salvation, but he gave us that first. And which can I better live without? Can I better live without my money or my salvation? What we receive from God is the closeness we feel to him when we share in his generosity, when we join in with the heart of God which is bursting with wanting to shower gifts on all of us. God has given us everything. Can we really not give it back to him? Can we not trust him to use whatever we hold in stewardship far better than we ourselves would use it? Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Life itself, Jesus Christ, new life, risen life, eternal life, we can't take the money with us. Are there really not others who could use it better? I love that anecdote about Frances Havergal packing up her jewellery. I stand here as a woman who loves her earrings. I guess mine aren't worth as much as it sounds like hers were worth. But why would I need any of my trinkets, any of my possessions, more than the benefit it could bring if they could be used in her case, in spreading the gospel through the Church Missionary Society. In the chapter before our reading today, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we read, They gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us as God willed it. Giving isn't the story. It's about what God has done in the heart first, in my heart and in my life. So take my life as our hymn says, and then take my silver and my gold. We are freely given God's grace. It starts to work in our lives and take root, and then we are able to offer that grace to others. Grace for us, in us, and through us. Take my silver and my gold, Lord. Not a mite would I withhold. Please, God. And please give me the grace and the generosity to start with the silver and the gold, not with the mites. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. Amen. Consecrated Lord to Thee, take my moments and my days, let 
then flow in ceaseless play. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. My love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet this treasure store. Take myself.